Welcome back, folks, to the WP Tonic Show. It's episode 494. Yes, we're getting close to the big 500. I didn't think I'd last that long. Uh, um, I, I really, I'm really proud of my tribe listening to me for 500 episodes. You're masochists at heart, I can tell. Uh, um, we've got a great guest, actually. I've been looking forward to this conversation. We've got Chris Lemmer on the show and he's been a member of the WordPress community for a long time and a great member of that community as well. So first of all, um, I'm going to let my co-host introduce himself. Adrian, would you like to introduce yourself to the listeners and viewers? Hi everyone. My name is Adrian. I am the CEO and founder of Groundhog. We help small businesses launch their marketing automation strategies. It's a great product. And Chris, would you like to introduce yourself to the listeners and viewers? Uh, hi there. My name is Chris Lemma. You can find me at chrislemma.com. Uh, I'm also the VP of products at Liquid Web and Nexus, our Liquid Web brand that focuses on managed WordPress, managed WooCommerce, and managed Magenta. Oh, that's great. And um, I just want to mention a couple of our great sponsors that really help the show. Um, first of all is Kinsta. Kinsta hosting. I've been hosting the WP Tonic site with them for the past couple of years. They're a great hosting company. They use Google as their platform. Um, what you get is a great interface, great technology, um, all the bells and whistles, not only for yourself, but for your clients. Plus, you get some really great support. They're really dedicated in their support to their clients. When I've ever approached them, I've always talked to somebody straight away that really knew their stuff and really tried to help me. And that makes a big difference to some hosting providers where you get the opposite experience. So if that sounds great, go over to Kinsta and tell them that you heard about them on the WP Tonic show. So let's go straight into it. So, Chris, um, how do you, how in general do you think the WordPress community is doing in 2020? Obviously, we've had the virus. That's really affected the community quite considerably. But in general, do you think people are busier, the same as last year, or a lot of people struggling? Uh, I think if you look at uh, product owners... I think they're, uh, depending on what segment of the market they were attacking, some of them are thriving more than ever because people are trying to get online. They're trying to spin up things and they need tools to do it. In particular, uh, the LMS community. Uh, sure, for sure. Um, I think you have other product companies that are uh, struggling if they were not considered essential to what you were doing. And so people are tightening their budgets and uh, turning off you know, auto renews and just saying, I, I just can't afford to spend money there. And then agencies, I think we've seen, uh, again, a mix. All of this is just, you know, different parts of the market. Micro agencies, freelancers have, have taken big hits and seen a lot of customers just say, hey, sorry, depending on what industry they're in. But if you were in, if you were building websites for travel, uh, related stuff, it's game over, right? And uh, so we saw a bunch, I've seen a bunch of agencies and micro agencies, small shops, three, five people, um, freelancers who are really struggling. At the same time, we've seen other slightly larger agencies who uh, maybe two thirds of their customers have, have closed down, but one third of their customers have gone bananas, right? If, if, you're, if you're a customer with, uh, say, you know, I live in California, if the California state government is your customer, everything is online, right? You, you, you want to put every possible group and, and all the forms and everything else you want to get online so people aren't coming into the building. They're pushing budget at that like, like crazy. Or if you are uh, a company that, that had done some marketing and now you want to double down because let's say you did all your, all your stuff in events, your budget for events just zeroed out. You're not sending people traveling anywhere. They're not going to those events. You're not getting your name recognition at those events. So they're pushing into other forms of uh, marketing spend. And so people who are doing uh, Facebook ads or creating landing pages or building funnels, we're seeing some of them uh, really take off. So all in all, uh, I think I would say 
it's kind of a 60 40 split. I think 60 hurting 40% are doing better. Uh, I think that's, uh, or maybe it's 70 30, but it's kind of like who targets what industries and what segments. And that's kind of how it's playing out. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think that's a great insight. Thanks for that summary. And I totally agree with it. Over to Adrian. You, you mentioned uh, some product people. I'm a product person. I sell WordPress plugins. And, and you started off the conversation with some are doing really, really well and some are not doing so well, especially if their business is considered non-essential to the bottom line. Uh, and before the show, we were talking, you, you had just started to introduce a free plan into... Uh, into your liquid web managed WooCommerce process and, and your hosting company. Now I went to Cabo press last year and it was an amazing experience. And one of the things I learned there was basically just wipe free from our commercial website. And I, yep. and I went home and I did that and immediately saw an increase in sales. And it was one of the greatest decisions I ever made. Yeah. Now it's almost like we have to revert back and like, Hey, listen, well, if, if we're no longer considered essential, how big of a role do you think that free is now playing for the product market space? It, it should businesses who were traditionally not free be really starting to consider, do we revert back and do we offer a free plan? Do we offer a free trial? How important is that long-term now? So I think the issue is, right? The conversation that we had in, in Cabo was there were, there were two studies that were done now about two, three years ago where it was membership sites, people were paying recurring monthly fee. And uh, two of these membership sites were, you know, or two of these studies looked at membership sites that were zero. They were free memberships. And they offered, uh, they told their customers, they notified their customers that they were gonna move from zero to $1 a year, right? $1 a year is not a lot of money. Um, uh, I mean, like just about anyone can pull together. If the quality of content is there, $1 a year, you could do. What they discovered was between 25 and 35% of the customers across all these different sites um, said no, quit, cancel. And that is the interesting dynamic is that there's some group of people that when they sign up to your forever free plan, they have no intention of ever spending with you. And that is what we call a tax right? That's a tax on your system because they're still calling in for support. They still want help. They still have issues and they're making product requests. They get angry when something doesn't happen. So my recommendation to most companies is start at a dollar a year. I don't care. Like whatever you want to do, just don't do free because free and especially free forever means you're just going to get a, a, a higher cost of service to deliver to customers who have no intention of ever spending a dollar. Now that's very different than a time-based window of free, right? So a free trial for 14 days is a tool for onboarding. It's a tool for saying, come check it out, right? Uh, a Nexus where we have a, it's a, it's a liquid web company, but it's where we've moved our liquid web managed WordPress and managed WooCommerce. At Nexus where we do this, and we just launched this um, middle of last month, we launched this free trial, 14 days, and I made one big mistake. I didn't think it was a mistake. Uh, if you had asked me, I all big mistakes start out as great ideas. <laughs> I, I, if you would ask me, if you'd ask me up until the day that I learned it was a mistake, I would have, I would have died on the opposite hill. What we did was we turned off access to SSH access, right? So first of all, SSH, SSH access is somewhat of a technical dynamic. Right, like it's not very like, developer. Like yeah, even even me, yeah, I've been a developer for several years, and even like I don't, I try to avoid it as much yeah. as possible. And like you're just not going to have a lot of end users who are like, I need SSH access. So we we turned it off. Uh, also, in you're doing a free trial, uh, you can have bad actors that that literally spin it up and then access in the box and then drop in uh, malware or whatever and use it. As a, as a vector into other attacks, right? And just use, use a bunch of these free tra So we said, okay, no, we're, gonna, we're just gonna close this down. I never thought that would be a problem. In fact, I thought it was a really good idea. And I, I landed on the side of saying, yeah, we should do that. So we did it um, and turned it on. And uh, I think it was, I think the first report of an issue came in about six days into it. Now, six days into a launch, uh, you know- and That's most a long of the time. time. Just, you're just like, uh, I don't know, it's random, like whatever. Um, but it was a customer that was only been with us three days, right? And 
after three days, the customer had tested enough stuff, said, how do I migrate my site to here? And our migration tools use SSH. And our migration tools require that you give it the, you know, the login, the password, whatever we show you in the display to bring it over. In my wildest dreams, I didn't expect that people after three days of a free trial were going to say, I want to move my site over here. Because first of all, if you know anything about the hosting space, people don't move their sites just randomly, right? Um, but that's second a, of all, it's a very go, like educated decision that they make. Yeah. yeah. And, and if they go try something, I imagine they were going to try for 14 days. And then we have emails that, you know, upgrade, you know, say it's time to make a decision and then we'll open up things and we'll show you that whatever. Three days in. And what's crazy is we got the first report, I think it was six days in, we got five more reports on day seven, another five reports on day eight. Like all of a sudden you're like, oh my, oh my goodness, right? Like we saw a market that said, um, I've seen all I need to see. I'm feeling the performance immediately. I want to bring my site right away. So of course we went back and said to the engineers, I got to, I got to expose this now. Right. And I, I like, I got it because people need to be able to migrate in. And, uh, and we, you know, released an emergency change and suddenly it's there for you. So um, I think what you learn is uh, free, a forever free plan is not something I ever recommend. I think you're going to end up with a weighty tax. I think it's not worth it. Um, but a limited free trial to get someone on board and get them to experience it is a great onboarding tool. You just have to manage all the different dynamics related to it so that they can have a really smooth onboarding. Now, beyond that, I will tell you, uh, there is also another benefit of doing something that may or may not be free, but is a heavy discount in these times, a heavy discount on a timeline. So Groundhog offers it to me for a dollar a month for the next four months. After that, it kicks back into normal pricing, right? But it gives me enough time to check it out, experience it, put it into use. And then I go, okay, I'm in it. I mean, what we've seen with companies that have very, very low or even free plans um, is that if you start using these things, you are able to turn something that may not be mission critical into something mission critical. Groundhog, of course, is a great example of this, right? Where you'd be like, listen, you haven't been sending out these emails. You haven't been doing this ongoing. You haven't been making these changes, but that's because you haven't ever done it. You don't have tools and you don't know how to do it. But if I get you to do it and I show you to do it and you start seeing the benefit of doing it, suddenly it does become mission critical. You can't live without it. So if you give yourself enough time, a dollar a month for four months, at the end of four months, you send them a note saying, hey, if this hasn't gone well and you're not happy and you're, you haven't seen any return on all this stuff, we're fine to say, let's just wrap this up and click this button and we'll cancel your account. Um, if you've discovered that this is life-giving and you're amazed at, at the leads that are coming in and how you're following up people, you're closing and converting more, uh, we want you to click this button and we're going to, or we just want to let you know that, you know, next week we're going to push it into the normal plan and here's what you'll be paying, right? Um, and this is not only, by the way, I just want to mention, this is not only applicable to product companies. This is applicable to service and, and course businesses and membership companies like across the board, right? Absolutely. In fact, it's even, it's even for services, right? You could, you could say, uh, let's say you have a maintenance care plan and you do product updates for people's WordPress websites, for example. Uh, and let's say it's $99. You want to go get some new customers, make it $12, right? But $12 for four months, right? Or $9 for four months. And you're saying, yeah, but Chris, that cost me. And you're like, well, well hold on a second, right? You can even limit it to a certain number of customers, right? Because you know, you have staff. Your staff has workloads. They also have capacity. That extra capacity is sunk cost. You're already paying for their salaries. You're already paying for that. So you have this window of sunk cost where you can say, I could probably bring on another 50 customers. Okay, well then go do it, right? And just give them a discount for four months and then pop it back up. Some people will leave, other people will stay, but you have gotten the volume, right? Most of the time, the biggest issue is getting people to cross from not paying to paying, not okay, what happens later when they've gotten enough value? Now, if you're not giving them a lot of value, they'll bounce when you push the prices up. But if you're giving them great value, you've just lowered the bar of entry to make it easier for people to experience how awesome you are. And then they're like, oh my God, yeah, fine, charge me. I love this. I can't live without it. What do you think about, just before I throw it back over to Jonathan, by the way, thank you for that. 
Uh, what do you think about premium products or premium services going or offering some sort of freemium model, which is my own business model? Well, you know, it's a, it's a sucker question because you know how I feel about freemium. But, uh, I do. <laughs> uh, don't do it, people. Uh, uh, it's fine. You can do freemium. What I tell people is if you're going to do freemium, you need to know two things. Number one, you need to know all your numbers. So if I walk up to a guy who's doing freemium and I say, uh, walk me through the unit economics. And he looks at me funny, like what's unit economics? I'm like, you're dead, right? You might be dead in a week, a month, a year. I don't care. Um, I'm, I'm... You, you better give a quick outline to some of the listeners what pre premium means. Yeah, so if, if someone's doing a freemium plan, what they're doing is they're saying, I'm giving you a product, it starts at free. And then I give you away when you want additional features or additional access or additional users, some metric is going to tweak and you're going to move up to a paid plan. And then, right. and then that, that will tweak again and you'll move up to another paid plan. Um, and that's fine. What you, and I don't like it. Uh, I, I, I don't think enough people do the math homework. Um, so that's unit, economics, <laughs> unit economics is an understanding of both your fixed and non-fixed costs to deliver that service, whether it's your hosting or whether it's the cost of licenses you pay, uh, all of that may be uh, fixed if you're on certain kinds of infrastructure or it may be very dynamic, um, but also on a per customer basis, what else, what else is involved? And it includes your marketing, it includes your sales, it includes- Support. Uh, a, yeah, your support, which is a big one. So uh, the first thing you have to understand is what's your profitability on, on a per unit basis and where does that change and, and how does it change? The other is you have to know your conversion, right? You have to know uh, what are the conversion rates go from zero to your first tier, your first tier, your second. You got to understand that conversion because that's going to play into understanding your uh, cost of sale, right? So um, anything I spend to win that deal, right? I, I, I worked years ago with a, a customer that had a premium and he's like, I don't pay anything. You don't pay anything to get customers? No, I don't pay anything. They come, they sign up, they sign up for free. And within a month, 20% of them shift over, right? It's just brilliant. I don't know why you hate this. And I go, you don't pay anything? Like you just get free customers? He's like, yeah. Go, okay. Well, let me ask you a couple questions, right? Like, do you do any ads anywhere? Yeah, but that's not, that's not related to this. Do you have a partnership that brings you leads? No, but, but we have these guys. Oh, do you pay them affiliate fees? Well, yeah, but out of the profit. Eh. Oh, stop. These are all costs of sale, right? Anything that is sales and marketing is your cost of sale. And just because you don't connect the dots doesn't mean the dots aren't there to be connected. So um, if you know your unit economics and you know your conversion. And it all says, yeah, it's good. Like, this is good for you. You should do this. I'm all for it. Go do it. If you don't know those things, not a big thing. Thank you for that. I think that's uh, pretty insightful for anybody who's trying to figure out what, how, how, how to satisfy the market need now to the fact that everybody's kind of like tightening the purse strings a little bit. Thank you for that. John? Yeah, we're going to go for a break, folks, and we're coming back. And we hope we've got a, a great discussion with Chris Lemmer. We'll be back in a few moments. We're coming back. Chris has given us some economical lessons <laughs> about how not to go broke. I feel educated. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, um, well, you know, but, you know, you know, if you t talk to Chris of um, Lyft LMS, that that's how they base their business. And I, but I agree again with um, Chris with knows I, his numbers, though. He knows his numbers, but I fundamentally agree with our guests. And and just just to put a fine point on it, go ask Chris how many different pricing plans and how many different models he used until he got to the one that he's at today, because it's not the one he started with. What he has I, today, I was the same way, yeah. What he has today works because he went through a whole bunch of different options and tweaked it a bunch of different ways. And uh, I think even he will tell you he lost a lot of customers in that learning, right? Because he, he was, oh, now we're going to charge it this way. And people were like, what? And they all left. 
And then even if he changed it and pivots again, it doesn't mean they all come back, right? <laughs> um, so it's a very hard lesson and it's never, oh, I'll just do this and it'll work and I'll just make money. Often it is painful. And I will say if it hadn't been for the product and how it was done and what they do, uh, I don't think he would have survived two or three pivots, right? So kudos to them for what they've done and how it's worked. And that's fantastic. But uh, doesn't mean that if you're starting today and you look at Chris and you say, Lifter LMS does it, I'm going to just copy them. You're in for a world of hurt if you're not in the exact same context, same industry, same business, same dynamic, because you're going to go do it in a different realm and then discover, oh, I got to do my three pivot. And then, oh, they never came back. And now I'm dead. Right. And that happens a lot more than pivoting two or three times, getting the right pricing model and saying, okay, now we're working. Yeah. Pricing's a nightmare, isn't it? Um, so are there a couple WordPress companies, plugins, whatever that come on your radar recently that you, that's got you excited and the individuals or the company you think they're doing something that's really original or, the way they're just doing business, you know, you think that's the way to do it. Anything revolutionary? Uh, yeah. Uh, I, 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 Apart from Groundhog. Okay. Um, I, I, uh, <laughs> I, think, I think there's several. And, um, you know, when you don't get the questions in advance, you're just kind of like, ooh, off the top of my head? Okay, let me, let, me get, let me get you an answer. So I'll tell you right off the top of my head, the first one is a company called Stratic. Uh, Stratic made the news recently. Uh, in that they just raised a pretty big round and they raised that round even though they're... Yeah, they Israeli got like a company. million dollars or something, right? Even though they're an Israeli company that raised money there, they also raised money out of Silicon Valley, um, which is fantastic. Uh, oh, what's, the, what's, the, what's the name? Oh, I've been rude. Stratic. We actually, we featured it on the round table before. Yep. Yeah, but I've interviewed the CEO, the lady. It's, it's so, the, yeah, Miriam. Uh, yeah, she's, she's, been, she's been pushing that for a lot... You know, it's been a real struggle they, for her, but they've, she, they've hasn't been, give, she hasn't given up on it, has she? She's no, no, just... no. They, they worked on it for several years. Um, they have a fantastic technical team, uh, an incredible support team. And what they do is they, um, they host your WordPress website. You go in and you use all the WordPress stuff like normal. You write posts and pages and all that. You push a button. They run all their magic conversion sauce on it. And... Uh, in the end, you get a static uh, website. Um, highly performant, you remove a bunch of the security issues, right? Because um, it's HTML and images and what have you. They've just finished an integration with Gravity Forms uh, so people can use forms. Although there are lots of other form tools you could use that are, and comment tools that are you know, uh, serverless that are interesting now. Um, but I think, I think what they're doing over there is uh, it's something Miriam has been working on for several years. The team over there is, is sharp. The product is sharp. And, uh, you know, I've, she's a, I have to have her back for interview. She's a bright lady. Though. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, that's, uh, that's one company that's worth looking at. Um, I think there are several others that are in that same vein of uh, performance. So uh, you likely know the, the company Blog Vault. Uh, they have, they have a SaaS based backup solution. They have a SaaS based, yeah, yeah. Uh, we, uh, we interviewed the CEO two weeks ago. Yeah. Akshat is an awesome dude. And, um, what I, what I love about what they're doing, right. Is, uh, cause they also have a security product. Um, they're focused on taking care of all the stuff that you never really wanted to think about anyway. Um, and that is. I think at the core of where some of this goes is the, the early stages of WordPress. Yes, there was a big focus on publishing, but there was also this inside the community focus on tools. Like we, we can build this and so we can build this and so we can build this. Um, forgetting that most customers don't want a tool, right? Like if I can live my entire life without going to a hardware store and buying a hammer and a drill, then I've won in life. Like if there's, <laughs> there's nothing about owning a hammer and a drill right? That makes me excited. Now, I happen to own both because every now and then I got to do something in the house. But if I could live life without them, I would, right? I don't wake up in the in Saturday morning going, God, I wish I had a hammer, right? I may wish that all my paintings are hung, but I don't wish I have a hammer. And WordPress community as a whole, often because we can build tools easily, because we like tools, because the platform's so open for tools, we get really caught up in building tools. Um, and Akshat isn't there, right? 
and, and blog vault and, and, and their, their products, they're not there. They're focused on, okay, the customer doesn't really need to know all of this stuff. They don't really want to know all this stuff. How do we help abstract away complexity? Um, it's a lot of what we do at Nexus and liquid web. We're trying on the same hosting level to add layers of product to the hosting so that you can abstract away and not think about those things. Right. Um, I think the more you do that, the more we shift the focus from tools to uh, ultimately uh, where people are trying to go, what they're trying to do. Solutions. Um, yep. And again, that's why I think Lyft LMS in the end uh, and Learn Dash and several others have had success is because they are right on the edges of what a customer wants, uh, which is different than, oh, what I really want is 16 more plugins uh, that do 16 more features on my website, right? Um, over to you, Adrian. What? Oh, I mean, I was, I'm sorry. I'm still reeling from just the, the impact of that last bit there. Uh, so let's talk about uh, your, your oh, yes, It's true. People got problems. People just want solutions for their problems. They don't, they're not really into the average punter isn't interested in all the bloody plugins. They just want solutions to their bloody problems. Don't they? If they could click a button and have uh, and have one of those beautiful Elementor like demo sites, just working with all of their content without having to think anything to transfer brain to computer they would that's that's a product somebody should build i could just think it it should just build itself that would be ideal let's talk about uh I, i'd love to talk just a little about how the the liquid web free trial is performing so you've been doing it for for a little bit and i'd love to know just what kind of the effects of that are not only on you know the success and the conversion rate but what what has the impact been on on the resources required to run a successful launch of a free trial that's, that's a great question. So um, we, uh, one of the other lessons we learned in the midst of this was where, where do we want to send people uh, when they're getting towards the end of the, uh, end of the free trial, right? So initially, we had spun it up to be pointed to support, right? Um, support has a facility to help them upgrade. I mean, they, they have the tools and technology to do it. Um, and, uh, and then we started digging into how those were going. Again, I just want to be very clear. We're like two and a half weeks into this. So we're at the very, very beginning of it. Preliminary but, results. So everything with a pinch of salt, got yeah, it. Yeah, but what we discovered was um, that these customers weren't all just activating into the lowest price plan. Um, that's, what we, that's what we activate for the free trial. So just to be clear, we did not make a free trial of every tier of offering. We made free trials at the lowest price plan we gave them the, the, the resources associated with that small plan. And then we imagined that most of them would convert into that small plan uh, if they convert, right? What we saw was support getting more and more questions about, well, what about that plan? What about that plan? And so we pivoted so that now the emails um, connect you up to someone in sales. Uh, and that was a dramatic adjustment again of saying, I have an idea. I think this should work. Collect the feedback and then make an adjustment based on that feedback. Because if I thought, I, what I really did think was we're gonna get a lot of people who come in who test the free version and then convert to the $19 and sit there. And the moment someone's like, no, I, I wanna buy the $500 version, you're like, whoa, I don't want the sales, I don't want the support guy selling it, right? I want the sales guy doing that because that, they know how to, how to do that. No offense to our support team, right? But just, I want the sales guys to get involved in that conversation. We didn't think we'd have that, right? So. Um, the early, the early numbers show, show several things. Uh, number one, um, we are getting, and, and, and we, we did the, the first version of this launch, the first two weeks, right? So right now things are getting ready to change. It was only direct, meaning we just announced it online. We announced it on a web page, We announced it on social and that was it, right? We didn't, uh, we didn't contact any of our affiliate network. Right? We didn't want to do the indirect yet. We just wanted to test it out, soft launch, if you will. Um, after two weeks of soft launch, what we discovered was um, there's good traction. Uh, people are, for the most part, they get to the, the page, they see the thing, and they click the button. Conversions are, uh, you know, it's, not, it's, it's hard to call a conversion when you're buying something for free, right? So just to be clear, I call conversion when they go from free to paid. But the people who are landing on a page or being told about an offer and clicking the free trial 
um, has been good so far. Good enough that we said, all right, let's give it to our affiliates. Now, knowing that I'm going to be paying the affiliate, right? I'm paying the yeah. affiliate uh, when they eventually convert, um, which cuts into my margin, right? But the only reason you do that, and th maybe that's one of the big takeaways here, uh, if you're trying to apply this strategy, the only reason you want to uh, not only, because again, unit economics, if I'm giving you two weeks of a product for free, I have zero margin. I have no revenue. Especially I'm, if they don't convert, then you're basically out. You know, it, yeah. co it costs money to run servers, right? It does. It costs so, money to do support, costs money to pay that sales guy to have that conversation. Yep. So, so, so my recommendation is you don't load up your affiliates because that's costing money on top of money. So you already know that you're costing yourself money with a free trial. If you do it for two weeks, you're phase shifting the revenue potential out two weeks, right? Doesn't mean you're going to get 100% conversion, but you're phasing it over and that phase shift still costs you resources. It costs you uh, hardware, it costs you licenses, it costs you support, and it may even cost you sales, right? So at that point in our soft launch, we didn't immediately launch it with, with affiliates because I don't want to double down on the, on the risk. On something so, that might not work. <laughs> it might not work. So let's just try it ourselves and see if we get enough uptick, right? That's the first question. Are people even willing to do a free trial? If we get enough uptick, that's the first bar you have to cross to say, yeah, okay, let's get a broader and get, our, our, get all the indirects and our channel to do it with us. That's the first part. The second bar is what level of conversion are we getting, right? You have to define your bar however you define it, right? Like, uh, and that's often a function of your capacity as well. Um, if I had, if I had uh, virtually no capacity in my server infrastructure, I would want really high conversion to keep running this forward because I don't want to give away free space when I have so little of it. If I have a lot of free space, my conversion requirement, my, my bar can come down. I can say, oh, if I get over 20% to convert, that's a win for us because that's just another channel for growing revenue, right? Um, and I'll, and I'll, I'll reclaim the other hardware back. Now, here's, here's a little tidbit that we caught. Our standard process when someone spins up a server with us and then uses it and then cancels, our standard is we wait another 30 days before we clear out the box, right? Because what if you cancel and then you're like, no, no, I made a mistake. I want to sign up again. You don't want me to say, well, tough, it's gone, right? Well, in a free trial, that's exactly the opposite of what I want. In a free trial, if you don't say yes on the 14th day, right? I want that stuff zeroed out, no holding it for 30 days. I want it to be cleared off and ready to use for the next free trial again, right? Which means sometimes you have to change your product you have to change your engineering, you have to change your operations, you have to change your policy, all to support this new thing. Because initially they're like, oh yeah, we can just do it. And you're like, wait, wait, time out. Tell me about this other part. Nope, we're gonna have to change that too, right? So we were gonna launch free trials, I think at the end of February, we ended up launching it in the middle of April, partly because there were things that had to change, right? In order to do that. Um, then of course, the second dynamic, once you understand all that, the second dynamic is what's your conversion rate, people that are buying. So far, we're seeing a really good conversion rate. So um, my bar, right, uh, um, I'm, I'm very comfortable, or I'm not gonna give you all the numbers, I'm very comfortable saying uh, my bar was, can I get one out of every four people to say yes, right? 25%, um, and we crossed that bar, right? Um, and we crossed that bar enough that I was like, okay. Time to double get, down. Get the affiliates on board, right? So this week they're talking to affiliates, they'll, they'll get it launched, we'll get more people out there talking about it, et cetera, right? Um, but then you have another dynamic, right? Because your affiliates, they want, they don't want one in four, right? Like, um, and again, we weren't one in four, we had crossed the threshold, but still, let's say you're playing down at some, some level. An affiliate wants, you know, prefers it to everything to close, right? So then you get this other component. How much am I willing to defer my revenue, right? By giving the, the affiliate another coupon that says when your 14 days are over, if you like it, here's a coupon that gives you 20% off of the list price so that you're not paying 19, you're paying 20% less than that. But that defers my margin even further. Because now you're order, giving 20% off on the revenue and then you're paying 20% on that price to the affiliate and yes. On the affiliate, okay, right? Uh, 
So then you have to know a different number, which is what's your lifetime value, right? How long is this customer going to hang? Because if the customer only stays for three months and I pay all that money out to the affiliate and the discounted on the revenue and the margin because of the first two weeks, I break, I, maybe I break even, maybe I lose money, right? But if the customer is going to stay for three years, no problem. I made all the money in the world, right? Like I'm good. So you have to know your unit economics more than anything else, right? You got to know your spreadsheets. You got to know your numbers so that you can make those decisions, right? One of the meetings I had on Friday uh, last week was saying, hey, uh, call this affiliate and this affiliate, give them a special deal to elongate a discounted price. And you can, for this one, you can go this far. And for this one, you can go this far. And the affiliate manager's like, are you kidding? That's awesome. And I go, I know my numbers, it's worth doing. And their audience will come in and suck this up. So let's go make it happen, right? So um, that's, that's part of strategy, but it's a critical, you got, you got to think about all of this if you're going to do it right. I have so many more questions, but yeah, I think well, we're going to save that for bonus content. Yes, um, um, I think Chris is up for staying on for another 15 minutes, um, which you'll be able to watch the whole interview on the WP Tonic website or YouTube channel. Chris, how can people find out more about you and your thoughts and what you're up to? Uh, you can, uh, you can, you can find my blog at chrislemma.com. You can find me on Twitter at, at Chris Lemma. Uh, and, uh, you can find my products over at Nexus, N-E-X-C-E-S-S dot net. Uh, I think, um, you will discover that not only is a free trial super awesome, you'll also discover, of course, that the performance, uh, is amazing. And, um, and, and maybe the, the best part about it is, uh, we spend all our day working with customers that are running LMS, uh, memberships, and e-commerce stores that need or sites that need high interactivity, people that are logging in. Uh, you want to be fast even if your cash is turned off, right? Um, those are the folks that, that find our products to be really useful to them. That's great. And Adrian, how, how can people find out more about you and what you're up to? So if you're looking for help, creating the email series that you're going to use and to encourage people to upgrade from their free trial to a paid plan, you can head on over to groundhog with two gs.io to download our marketing automation plugin, which does, uh, despite Chris's advice, start <laughs> with a free core plugin. Uh, and we're more than happy to help you uh, set up your first marketing automation funnel. All right. All right, audience, we're going to wrap up the podcast part of the show. We'll be back next week with another great guest like Chris giving you insights about WordPress, technology, marketing, and learning management systems. We've got a broad set of interests on this podcast, but it all fits together. We'll be back next week, folks. Bye. Well, Chris. Um, another guest like Chris? I mean, are there, are there a lot of There's no guests? one else like you. He yeah. just says that. <laughs> I meant, I, meant, I meant that in a nice way, Chris. The broad I'm just dog. messing with you. Yeah, of course you are. I, I deserve it. Uh, Rob, I've got broad soldiers. I mess with people. So um, so on our round table show, which I hopefully you agreed to go on that, um, if you're up for it, uh, Rob, sure. we have a, 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 a certain uh, member that... Preaches, His name is Spencer. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> uh, that... that um, <laughs> That hosting is really just a commodity and a commodity that is going down in value quite rapidly. And I, I see, like a lot of things that Spencer says, I see an element of truth in it and an element um, because obviously I'm in the support uh, and building of learning management systems. So I see a lot of frustration from people that come to us for advice because they're really with bad hosting right yeah. and it gives a lot of it gives wordpress and lifter and learn dash a bad rap right yeah yeah um but also i think the hosting industry hasn't done itself a lot of favors either by the the way it's marketed itself and especially through affiliate through bounties basically offering large bounties would you agree with that and um do you, do you think it's done itself some damage, you know, by, by its own actions, really, the industry in general? So I think, I think the first thing you got you to gotta start with is an understanding that most hosting companies are tiny little mom and pop shops, 
most hosting companies generate less than a million dollars a year. Most hosting companies are, are tiny. Like I, I, I met one where the servers were in their bedroom. You're like, what the hell are you doing? We tend to think of hosting companies as GoDaddy. There aren't a lot of GoDaddies, right? There are not a lot of those companies. There's not a lot of EIGs that have a whole bunch of brands, but it's one big infrastructure. There are not a lot of those, right? The majority of the hosting companies were tiny little players that came into the market simply because customers needed something, right? And so geographically, they got spread out. Pricing, you know, it was shared hosting for the longest time. Nobody ever thought, I mean, dear God, let's be clear. Nobody thought Amazon was going to take off. And nobody thought that everybody and their brother was going to need hosting, right? These were not presumptions of an industry that we're in today. We are in one of the few industries that keeps evolving and becoming more mission critical every day. Cars are connected to the internet. Nobody thought that except the guys who wrote Back to the Future, right? Like, come on, this is just, this is unprecedented. So in that context, Shared hosting was exactly what you thought you were getting. And then VPS was exactly what you thought you were getting. People didn't think they were getting anything more than that. It's just that everything else evolved faster. You start building SaaS products and you start building websites. A website used to be just HTML, text and images. You can load that anywhere. You could cache that anywhere. In the last 10 years, we've dramatically changed what someone's doing online. The first time I built a SaaS, which was in 1997, the first time I built a SaaS. Fun fact, that was the year I was born. <laughs> yeah. was, and we called it an application server provider, an ASP. We were doing this stuff. The guy looked at me and said, you're trying to build an office in an elevator. Right? That was his idea. Like, who the hell puts a desk in the elevator? And who puts a lamp in the elevator? And who puts a chair in the elevator? You just don't build software in a browser. The browser is stateless and you can't build an application. And guess what? We now build applications and the web has state and we do all sorts of crazy things. We build offices and elevators. Now we're shocked that the elevators don't do exactly what we thought we do. And it turns out that elevators are fairly nondescript. So Spencer is right. It's all commoditized. It's renting a box. You get a box, you get a box. You want a box, you get a box, right? Speeds and feeds are where it's at. And by the way, the customers have no clue what speed or feed, what infrastructure they need. They don't know if it's shared. They don't know if it's VPS. They don't know if it's cloud. They don't know if it's cloud dedicated. They don't know if it's managed apps. They don't know what they need because I've gotten into millions of elevators in my lifetime and I know nothing about them. About the sum total I know is how to push the button and where it says what it's rated for in case there's too many people in the elevator. I know very little about elevators. I use them all the time. Part of what happened is this thing that was a commodity, this thing that was a default became a really important thing to so many things. And the populace didn't ever experience or learn more about it because frankly, it's still just a utility, right? I know tons of people that get in elevators. They know nothing about it. I know tons of people that get in cars and know nothing about how it works, right? So I think we do a disservice, right? When we think that the hosting company is doing a disservice because the hosting company is sitting in a context that it, neither it nor anyone else could have imagined would get here, which is why most of those hosting companies, right, got smacked on the side of the head when an online store called Amazon decided, well, I have some extra capacity. Why don't I create AWS? And they're like, who the hell's going to want to host anything? I mean, I, I, I'm old enough. I had conversations where people were like, who the hell's going to want to host anything with Amazon servers, right? Um, turns out the planet. And so many people that then Google got in the game, Azure got in, the, Microsoft got in the game, and we got three hyperscalers, right, that are changing the nature of hosting so that the rest of those guys, right, the rest of those little mom and pops and all those other hosts, they're looking at this going, uh, we don't have developers. We don't build products, right? When I joined Liquid Web three and a half years ago, we had software guys, we had engineer people but they were focused in DevOps. They were making sure that the platform did what it was supposed to do, that billing did what it was supposed to do. I show up and I'm like, I want to build a product. Where's the product team? We don't have a product team. Okay, we're going to have to build a product team, right? And most hosts haven't built a product team. So 
you, you know, the, the reality is, yes, if you're looking at regular hosts, they are commoditized to the point that they're going to they're gonna get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. The hyperscalers, Google, AWS, uh, Azure, you, you are seeing that not only are they providing uh, hosting, they're providing tons of disparate functions, separate functions that you can pull in. Whether you're talking serverless, whether you're not talking, whether you're talking about Lambda, whether you're talking about functions as a service, backend as a service, they are layering on top because other people are coming in and saying, I want to build and I need more than just hosting. And hosts like Liquid Web and Nexus are building platforms, products on top of hosting, delivering that value so that a customer says, oh, good, that's what I want. I want an online store, right? My competition is not Flywheel. It's not WP Engine. It's not Kinsta. My competition is Shopify, right? That's a hosted platform that delivers a store. I believe we can create a SaaS that is for WooCommerce. That's what we're doing at Nexus, right? But it's changing the paradigm to being, oh, I'm not just a host, right? And that is, that's work. And not every host is embracing that. So we will see some hosts erode down to two and $3 a month. We'll see other hosts like us pushing prices up. Um, and we'll see SaaS platforms compete and deliver direct value to customers without Squ Squarespace e-commerce. If you go to Squarespace and sign up for the e-commerce plan, it'll tell you how much it costs. And then in the list of features, it says free hosting. You're like, no, it's not. That's what I'm paying you. Like I'm paying you $49 or $79, it includes hosting. But because they have trained their customer to abstract to, you get this GUI, you get this page builder, you get this, you know, what their features. And then they go, ooh, hosting is free. And you look at that and you go, this is awesome. I should do this here because on the other place I have to pay for hosting. So we will see more abstraction. That's, that's, that's my guess, right? We'll see more abstraction and it'll shift where, where people think they're sending the money. In the end, we still have hosting. I mean, it, everything about serverless, they say, oh, it's serverless. And you're like, well, yeah, it's, it's function-based programming, but it's, let's be clear, there's still a server there. It's just not your server. You don't manage the server, but there's still a server. There'll always be servers. We will have to pay for those servers one way or another, whether we rent it by the, the function call or whether we pay a, you know, a static price, that's, that's immaterial. In the long run. I've just got a little e extra question before I put it over to Adrian. A one of my little um, hobby horses of, that gets me, I wouldn't say angry, but gets, starts getting my blood, is developers that sell hosting, like they get like digital ocean up and running and then they get a client on digital ocean and they know nothing about Linux administration and it's running and then something happens and they can't sort it out. And then they dump the client, you know, um, I, I just, it just gets me going really, Chris, <laughs> what do you reckon about that? So, so there, there are a, a ton of people that do that. Right. Um, when, when, uh, when I was writing daily on my, on chrislama.com, uh, there were people that would then call me later, send me an email later and say, hey, that article yesterday, uh, it was perfect because I was on the phone with a customer. I was pitching him a service, but I didn't know how to build the membership site, but I was pitching him that I would build the membership site. And then your article came and told me how to do it. And I'm like, you were pitching a service you didn't know how to do, right? Like, that's cheeky, but okay, good on you, right? Um, and people do it with, with servers, right? They, they, whether, they, whether they buy a VPS plan um, or whether they go you know, to, to an, another platform, another player, and they spin up DigitalOcean and they go, now I have you know, unlimited box that I can just throw as many different clients on. They are charging their customers. And sometimes they're charging their customers far more than they're, uh, than they're paying. But they're like, and they run around, right? They go give talks and whatever. And they're like, look, this is a great business model. And you're like, it's a great business model until uh, everything hits the fan, right? And when it hits the fan, uh, you're in trouble, right? And, uh, and you, gotta, you gotta know things, right? You gotta understand what's the containment like, right? If, I, if I'm putting it on uh, a, an environment where malware on one site can affect another site, oh boy, I'm in trouble, right? That's not good. If I can't cross that boundary, if there's containment, but performance resources underneath are shared. High cost of, of resource on one site affects performance on the others. Oh boy, I'm in trouble. 
What happens if I just get real big success and the infrastructure isn't tuned for it? I had, a, I had a call with a guy last week. He did a webinar. He'd been doing webinars all through this year. And every time he did a webinar, he would send the people at the end to his WooCommerce store. And more and more people were coming to the webinar. And so therefore more and more high concurrent traffic was going to the site. The site didn't have any other stuff in it except the shopping cart to close the deal. And he finally got to a point where uh, the whole thing aired out. 502 errors across the site. He, he sent 10,000 people to the site. Whole thing fell over. He calls up his host, uh, who is not a host. He calls up the guy that hosts for him. Um, and it's a developer who has some infrastructure somewhere. And he says, what do we got to tweak? And the guy doesn't know. He's a, he's a software developer. He's a plugin developer. He's a theme developer. He is not DevOps. So he doesn't know the settings. He doesn't know what to tweak. Not all PHP workers are equal, right? He doesn't know what timeouts to set, memory recollection to, to do. He doesn't, he, doesn't have, he doesn't have any of that set up, much less actually how many child threads were, you know, should be set on the, on the server. So he calls me and complains, tells me, you know, this is what I'm doing. Maybe I should switch over to you guys. And I, I said, well, before you switch or anything, do me a favor, go to this setting in this, you know, web server and change this number uh, and see if that does you good, right? So he does, and then he calls me back after that webinar. He goes, it worked, everything worked, like it magic. Like the, all the customers went, they were all able to check out. I go, yeah, you, your, your uh, PHP worker thread count was low. And when you, when you hit the max, it was a cliff, it dropped off and, and you had 502 errors. And he's like, how come my guy didn't tell me that? I'm like, cause your guy probably didn't know that, right? Um, I can't tell you how many deals that guy lost because his host didn't know how to configure it correctly. Uh, and so he had a whole bunch of 502 errors the, the webinar before. And so none of those people turn into sales, right? Um, and that's real money down the drain. Uh, it, it, it bothers me, but I, I can't get worked up over it. No, right? you can't. It's something you do. But it's just, it, it, you know, I, I listened to it. And I listened to uh, There's a number of forums I'm on and Zooms and you have these people. And I know what they're doing. They, they, they're just a developer um that doesn't know boundaries as far as i'm concerned over to well, you well some of them some of them do that but i'll tell you i i have known agencies that have that are you know good sized agencies that have started selling hosting because they're like well i want full control over all this stuff and they don't realize the burden they're taking and then you'll talk to them two months or six months later when they've lost their shirt right because they didn't know devops well enough and they're like yeah we're getting out of hosting we were selling it now we're not getting it. it's not Sometimes it's not just lazy. Sometimes they think this is a good revenue stream and you realize in order for it to be a really good revenue stream, you also need a whole bunch of people, right? Um, uh, Elementor just raised a round of funding and uh, in one of the notices, one of the e emails or, or PR, you know, one of the press releases, they said something like they're looking at doing hosting, right? So- Well, well surprise, surprise. Yeah, so immediately I had people ping me like, do you know this? Did you know this? They're gonna do this. Like, are you worried? I'm like, <laughs> A product company getting into hosting, I'm not worried at all, right? Like, it's a lot of work. I'm not, I, I'm not doubting they can pull it off, but it will not be pulled off correctly the first time. They will have a lot of learning to do because building a product has nothing to do with the DevOps related to hosting. And uh, I'm inside a host, and I can tell you, the number of times things break, customer never sees it, customer never experiences it. We, you have to have the redundancies and the monitors and the tooling but you would spend gazillions of dollars building that up from scratch, right? So, yeah, and, and, I, I, want, and I just want to point out to the listeners that WP Tonic, we offer a hosting package, but I offer it with a partner. Um, yeah. I'm with a partnership. I'm not trying to offer hosting through uh, droplets and trying to manage it myself. I have a hosting company that I did a deal with that um, actually... Um, offer the requirements for somebody that's looking to run a website on a learning management system. Over to you, Adrian. Chris, the fact that you are in a hosting company gives you a, a neat perspective into the into this question. Uh, we were talking about hosting companies, which are kind of like getting their pricing down to the bottom of the barrel because it's heavily commoditized. And a lot of them are acquiring products like other WordPress plugins, themes and stuff in order to offset the value that their hosting actually provides and, 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 and give it kind of like a superficial boost. Do you think that's a winning strategy long-term or are they seriously going to have to kind of do what liquid web is doing and really building a 
a, like a SaaS product for, for the yeah. WordPress hosting space? So I, I, I don't know that everyone is trying to, I mean, let's, let's be honest. Uh, WordPress plugins don't make any money, right? Like uh, real money, when you're talking to a hosting company, uh, they're not going to have their revenues offset by buying a plugin. Um, even if the plugin does $4 million a year, the hosting company is doing 200 million. Ford is rounding air, right? Like, so I don't, I don't necessarily agree with the premise. I don't think all of these hosts um, are trying, when they buy a plugin, I don't think they're trying to supplement their income because the revenues on these products and- No, not, that, definitely not supplement income because like the biggest WordPress company is like maybe yeah. just under 10 million a year, yeah. Syed. I, I, but like- I think what's happening is, I think the competition- is driving them to differentiate. And normally that differentiation starts not with an acquisition, it starts with a partnership, right? Let's bundle this and that, we'll partner together. And um, which by the way, is a WordPress plugins dream, right? Like they have been begging for hosts to do distribution deals because they're like, ooh, I don't have to do sales and marketing. I just give it to the host and they'll deploy it everywhere. They don't often realize the economics of that, right? Like I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll put your stuff into my platform. If I test it, it's rigorous, it's awesome, and my customers need it, I'll do it. How's, uh, how's two cents a, a plugin deployed sound, right? And they're like, I, ch I charge $49. I'm like, not through me, you don't, right? So hosting economics and product economics are not the same. That's always a rude awakening. I don't, I don't pay one and two cents, but I know hosting companies that do. Um, so uh, I think the real issue is it's a differentiation game. Right, and I think if you are specializing in WordPress, but you're as a host, but your only offer is that you installed WordPress for them, right, and that's it. Like you don't have any additional stuff. I think you're gonna get left in the dust. I don't think I don't think anyone's saying, yeah, that's the bar. It might have been the bar ten years ago, right? Ten years ago, I had to install WordPress on my own, so you do a one-click installer. Uh, and then other people came in and said, we're managed WordPress hosts. We'll do the install for you. You don't have a one click at all. And by the way, we'll give you the latest version of WordPress rather than those one click installers that were like two years out of date. Whole different ball game back then. Today, saying I have a website, you know, I have a host and you can run web WordPress on it. I just don't think it's enough, right? So you have to differentiate and that differentiation often starts with some bundling and then becomes a, well, we've done enough deals here. Why don't we just buy the company, tuck it in and build out some synergies. I do think there are some companies and WP Engine is one of them. Uh, Nexus, where we, we do our, our stuff is another, um, where they are building product. They're building product. And so um, what they're trying to build over there, what we're trying to build over here, they're different markets, they're different customers, but they're still trying to build product. And that's different than uh, a hosting company that, that doesn't have product people. It's a hosting company that just is DevOps and support, right? So one of the easiest ways to tell is just to find out, does a hosting company have a product team, right? And if they don't, then you go, okay, uh, I, can, I can predict where you're, you're just going to go commodity. You're going to go down market. You're going to get cheaper and cheaper because you don't have a way to step up into the market. If you hire a product team, if you have a product team, uh, I think you're likely going to move towards some partnerships, some building some bundles and creating some distinguished value. Um, you got time for one more question? Sure. Yeah. If, uh, if somebody come to you f um, for some consultancy and they were saying, we're looking to build a learning management, you no know, courses, we've got a big audience you know we're a big play in this particular industry when we want to go online and we were looking at, at kajabi or wordpress what would you what would you say to them what would be the strengths of kajabi and what would be the strengths of wordpress totally depends on who's asking the question right so if a person is a uh, customer not a developer what they're going to value often uh, especially if that customer has content already. I got my videos, I got my worksheets, I got my documents, I got my stuff. That person is gonna wonder, um, how can I do something with the least amount of technology and the fastest time to market? And so, you know, Kajabi could do that. LearnDash, Lyft or LMS could do that. 
Um, but uh, Podia could do that. Uh, Teachable could do that. Teachery could do that. There are several players that could do it. And what they're going to look for is if I'm the one doing it, if I don't have a developer, right? How fast, how easy uh, can I put this stuff in there and start selling? Uh, the other thing they're going to often ask is, does this integrate with my tool chain already? Am I running Active Campaign? Am I running ConvertKit? Am I running MailChimp? And does it integrate? Am I, what am I doing for you know billing? I, I already have a Stripe account. Will it integrate with Stripe? I have Authorized.net. Will it integrate? A lot of times, end users make decisions that way. Does this work with my existing tool chain or do I have to start all over again? How easy is it to use? How fast can I start making money? Um, if they're a developer, <laughs> they don't ask any of those questions, right? That's not how they think. They're like, how extensible is it? How much can I customize it? Uh, how well can I integrate with it, right? And, uh, and what, what, ha what is other code bases that people have written for it, right? Um, so a developer who's looking to build that out uh, looks at it very differently and may say, oh, WordPress is way better than Kajabi because I have a million, a trillion different uh, players who know WordPress, understand WordPress, understand why it's important to build their endpoints or their connectivity and integration back to WordPress compared to others. And so uh, this is a lot easier, right? Um, I already know WordPress or I already know the language, the coding, right? PHP and what have you. So um, it really depends on who the customer is and what they value and how they value uh, what, or what they care about most is gonna drive my recommendation to them. Yeah, I see that. All right, thanks for that, Chris. All right, it's been a fascinating interview. Thank you so much, Chris. I think we've covered a lot of good stuff, actually, Chris. Um, I, feel, I feel incredibly educated. It was definitely a high, it was, this, today was high value for sure. Awesome. Right. Thanks, well, Thanks. We'll be back next week with a, another super type guest like Chris. Obviously, you can't compare to Chris, but it'll be similar, hopefully. Uh, we'll be back next week, folks. Bye.